Good morning, Columbia, and good morning, Scooter. That was for you from Jill and the Boys. Of course, it was Frank Sinatra singing Fly Me to the Moon. And uh, one point of history, according to White Flight, Gene Kranz, that song was played during the Apollo 11 mission to the moon, so we think you're in good company there. Oh, that was outstanding, Dan. Thanks so much uh, for playing that. I think we uh, all enjoyed it. We're not going quite to the moon, but I feel like uh, we've reached some real heights here on this mission, so uh, thanks. That was great. Houston, Columbia, for an Internet question. We're ready. Mario, this uh, question comes from Tom Dowling, New York, New York. And his message is, first, great work to all aboard and at MCC. I am the webmaster at the New York City Fire Department, and we all here at the FDNY take pride in your accomplishments. We are posting updates to our Internet sites to keep our uni uh, uniformed and civilian members current with your activities. We are also thrilled to know one of our own is on board. Michael Massimino is the son of the late Mario Massimino, retired manager and chief inspector from our Bureau of Fire Prevention. As Michael, do you have any messages for the members here at the FDNY? All the best to the crew, the MCC, and all the staff supporting these vital missions and programs. And uh, my answer, Mr. Dowling, is uh, first, uh, I am really thrilled to have gotten this note uh, here on orbit. Uh, just wonderful to know that uh, some people at the fire department are, are thinking about us, and, uh, and you took the time to write this note. I'm really uh, thrilled to get it. My father, uh, as you mentioned in your note, died a few years ago, and unfortunately he uh, couldn't be there to see the launch in person. But I wanted to do something to commemorate his memory and kind of bring something of his with me. And uh, when I talked to my mom about this, uh, she said, well, you know what's meant the most to him and to us was uh, the fire department. So on board with me in my personal kit, I have my father's uh, fire department pin. And that's really a treasured possession of mine. and something that I'm flying not only for my dad, but in honor of all the folks at the New York City Fire Department. And uh, growing up... Uh, with the fire department being such a big part of our lives as when I was a kid and growing up in New York, uh, it really uh, it really made an impression on me of the wonderful work that they do and how, uh, how important the work is that they do at the fire department. Some of my best memories are going to work with my dad and visiting the fire stations and meeting his friends and his colleagues. And uh, the memory of, of my dad and, and those memories of growing up uh, with the fire department uh, are still with me today. They're my heroes. The people of the fire department, New York City Fire Department, are my heroes. They were when I was a kid growing up, and they still are today. They're an inspiration to me here on this flight and every day. And I really want to thank them for thinking about us and for writing this note. And I uh, really hope that I get a chance to uh, keep in touch with them in the years to come as well. So, Mr. Dowling, thank you very much for your note, and best wishes to everyone at the uh, FDNY. Mike, nice touch, uh, fitting way to honor your father, and a nice salute to the New York uh, Fire Department. Appreciate that. We'll pass that along. Columbia, Houston, Alpha, Yuri, Carl, and Dan are standing by for your phone call. Please go ahead. Kostbucha, uh, Space Station Alpha, how are you today? A good, good day, Columbia. How are you today? Hey, if, uh, greetings from the Space Shuttle Columbia to the International Space Station Alpha. It's great to be up here in orbit with you. We're glad uh, to be along, uh, sharing some time, flight time in space. How are you doing today? Oh, thank you, great. Uh, we just to change our show. So what about you? We can see that you have today yellow and green. Is that correct? You guys look great. Must be uh, must be good to be getting out of those uh, those spacesuits for for a change and into some uh, regular clothes. Looks like you're having a good uh, good day. 
It's been uh, it's been a very busy time, but you're right. We're having a little bit of uh, kickback relaxation time today, and I think the whole crew is appreciating that. Let me turn it over to uh, Jim Newman. Hey, Dan, it's uh, good to be talking to you here. And I just wanted to, uh, from Nancy and I, fellow classmates, to, to you and Carl, wanted to say hello. And in particular, it's good to be back in space at least at the same time as, uh, as uh, you and Carl. Yeah, it's great. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, this, this past week has been great uh, following you guys. And, uh, Jim, we just want to let you know that some things uh, never change. We're still, uh, we still have lots of shrimp cocktail left over that uh, Frank uh, left us. Oh, very good. I was telling some stories about uh, overdosing on shrimp cocktail myself on uh, STS-51. Didn't put, put quite enough uh, water in one of those, and uh, that horseradish was a little bit too much dry. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been uh, sort of working working at those uh, shrimp cocktails, and uh, and uh, we're we're trying to whittle them down. But there's there's a whole bunch of them. And uh, Jim, uh, how would those uh, tools work up there? Uh, you know, we had a chance to look at them, uh, I guess, about uh, eight years ago, and they worked pretty well then. They they still working pretty good. Yeah, in fact, uh, it is ironic because I ended up being on the HST PFR, which we tested and also using the HST PRT for swapping the big scientific instrument in and out, the power ratchet tool and the portable foot restraint. And they both worked great as, as you and I uh, showed uh, those many years ago. Well, that's, uh, that's great news. And uh, I, I'm glad that we were able to, to, to work together on that uh, uh, back on STS-51. Well, it was quite a treat, and we've enjoyed following what you all are doing on the space station. We're very impressed. Now that we've been up here a little over a week, we can only marvel the fact that you all have been up there for over three months and, uh, and how you guys must be doing and, and how expert you must be at everything you do because we're, uh, we're still in that first week, second week uh, learning curve, and uh, as you know, it goes quickly, but still we can only imagine how, what finesse you all must have in space now. Yeah, it's 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 uh, we've probably come a long way, but every so often I have I have uh, some uh, moments where I where I maybe have, right after I wake up in the morning and I'm a little clumsy. But uh, anyways, yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. We were wondering what the views like from uh, up that high. We uh, we just had an incredible pass at night over the U.S. and it was so clear we could see from Miami to. Boston, we saw Chicago, we could see well past Houston, and uh, Tim and I were up here in the scooter's window, and we just could not believe the incredibly awesome view. At uh, Up here at 315 miles, you really get a lot of curvature of the Earth, and it's just incredible. Are you guys, um, uh, it sounds like you guys have a early morning, uh, is it going to be a, a night landing, or are they, they shooting for right after sunrise? Uh, our first opportunity is at night, uh, we think. It uh, depends on uh, what they decide to bring us in for. The uh, second opportunity is going to be one of those uh, maybe pinkies, uh, commander's landing, as we used to say in the Navy, as I know you remember, Dan. Yeah, don't forget to put on your uh, cheater scooter. Hey, I haven't gotten uh, to that point yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just the hairballs are wearing cheaters. Hey, got me that. Hey, before I forget, I don't know if you heard it yesterday. We just want to say congrats to um, Digger and Mike for their uh, first flights, and, and uh, congrats to uh, Rick and, and also Mike for the first EVAs, and uh, congrats to, to all of you again. Um, I'm sure you've heard this too many too many times, but uh, you all have had a uh, great mission, and uh, we wish you all a, a, a nice, uh, soft uh, Navy landing. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan. It really is a thrill to be up here. A dream come true. Uh, it's been a great flight, and great to fly with uh, these folks here, and uh, just, uh, just a wonderful experience uh, and a great first flight. I just wanted to 
give you all our very best wishes, our sincere appreciation for what you're doing on station, how important we think it is, and uh, I want you to know your, our hearts uh, and thoughts and prayers will be with you till you guys return, and we hope to be waiting there on the ramp when you come back. All the best for the rest of your mission. Okay, thank you, Columbia. Have a good flight and see you on the ground. Hi, this is an answer from Kefren, uh, a question from Kefren Hunter from Centerville, Illinois, age 8. And uh, the question is, to pilot Dwayne Carey, I noticed you have a pretty cool watch from the pictures on NASA TV. Do you need a special kind of watch to fly in, fly in space? What kind of watch do you have? And do all astronauts have the same watch? Well, this is a pretty special watch. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an, made by Omega, and uh, NASA actually gives us choice of a few different kinds of watches to fly in space, and I chose this one because it has uh, a lot of features that I like. It's not my watch. I'll have to give it back when I'm done with the mission. Um, what makes it handy to fly in space, Catherine, is the fact that there are several timers. I can, with this one watch, I can see what time it is at the Cape, I can see what time it is for our mission elapsed time on the mission. I can see what the uh, Greenwich Mean Time is. And I've also got several timers and alarms I can set up. And a lot of our tasks on space are tied to certain times that uh, it, we have to accomplish them at certain times. So I can set alarms on my watch to remind me to do uh, the next job that I'm scheduled to do. So it's a very handy watch to fly in space. Yeah, it looks real fancy and everything, and I really like it. But after the mission, I'm going to give it back. Thanks a lot. Okay, Houston, uh, we have an internet question here, and this one's from uh, Nigel Middleton from England. The uh, question is actually addressed to the pilot and commander, but uh, they said that uh, I could answer it since I sit uh, right in the center and, and just behind them. And the question is, uh, when the shuttle takes off, we see the amount of vibration on film. How do you cope with this when trying to view the instruments and press buttons without losing focus? Uh, and that's actually an excellent question. Uh, we have a whole suite of simulators that we train in prior to the mission. And, uh, Nigel, actually the one thing that we really uh, don't train uh, quite exactly for is the intense vibration, especially in first stage when you're on the solid rocket boosters. That was probably my biggest surprise on my uh, first mission. This is my fourth mission as a flight engineer. And that was really a surprise to me that uh, it took a little bit of effort to concentrate on the forward uh, displays so I could assist the pilot and commander in watching over the systems. And, uh, of course, you can see I, I, uh, I wear glasses now, and it's even a little worse when you wear glasses because they start bouncing around, too. So you can probably see in the camera views that are typically located behind us looking forward that uh, it is a uh, shake, rattle, and roll in first stage, and uh, but then it gets quite smooth after solid rocket boosters are out. Are, uh, away from the vehicle, and second stage is actually quite smooth, except for the constant acceleration and the G-forces building up. Hey Nancy, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a quick question. Uh, there is something that uh, we practiced numerous times in the simulator, yet it surprised me when we finally did it in space, especially after we were up here a while and got adapted to zero G, was uh, the first... Uh, not the first, but after about three days in orbit, we did a rather large uh, Ohm's burn, and uh, something happened that kind of surprised me. Do you remember that particular uh, incident? Bob uh, Digger, uh, I think uh, what was amusing to the crew up here was watch, to watch the flying MS-2 on the uh, flight deck during any of the Ohm's burns, and especially during a two-engine Ohm's burn. Uh, MS-2 went uh, from my position uh, just uh, hovering over C-3 here in the center panel, as you can see behind me, uh, to being plastered against the aft uh, wall and, and the aft windows. Uh, Jim Newman really helped out. He planted his feet right behind me and pushed me back forward. And uh, it's amazing that even after just a few days in space, that acceleration from the own engine lighting uh, really caught me by surprise. As it did me, uh, as soon as the engine slipped, we were, Scooter and I were watching our instruments, but out of my, the corner of my eye, I could see, I could see Nancy one instant, and the next instant she was gone. And uh, that's, that's all for today. 
Columbia currently passing over Houston and the Johnson Space Center. Uh, the crew again uh, enjoying an off-duty period this morning, a quiet day in orbit for Columbia's astronauts before they begin the work to prepare to come home early Tuesday morning to the Cape. Columbia Houston, we have some folks outside. You're going to have about a 34-degree elevation, so it should be a good pass as you're uh, going overhead here. And we're also done with the next card and the ProShare machine. If you have any more, we'll certainly get to work on it. Okay, Mario, this question is from Brian Mindeman of Mosini, Wisconsin, age uh, 35. His question is, how do the shuttle crews keep from dropping tools in space? Well, Brian, that's, uh, that's a really good question. Brings up a good point. In space, uh, just about anything can get away from you, including the shuttle if you're out there floating. So for that reason, we have tethers on everything that we take out with us and use, including ourselves. We're tethered to the orbiter along one slide rail, as you might see down the sides of uh, Columbia, uh, where the radiators go out on the payload bay doors. And every piece uh, that we take out with us from the airlock uh, is tethered to us or a large tool station back. So a lot of times when you see us working, you'll see things floating everywhere. But if you check really close, there'll be little tethers coming down attaching it because uh, if you lose it and it's out of your grasp more than an eighth of an inch, it's gone forever. And so for that very reason, we're very careful with uh, what we do out there. Everything is tethered. Okay, my commander brings up another good point. He asked, why didn't I tether to the solar rays? And uh, I wanted to, but uh, <laughs> because it was such such a large mass, uh, it was uh, determined that it would be unsafe to tether to that because it could actually uh, cause problems uh, uh, in terms of taking me off the arm with it and uh, perhaps damaging the suit and or the uh, uh, RMS, the manipulator arm, because of its large mass. So the only tether in that case uh, were my arms, and uh, you can bet that I had a death grip on that baby. Hey, Rick. Uh I was curious, when you guys were out there, uh, how do you keep from getting disoriented? It looks like there's no upside uh, up, no upside down, no sideways. How do you keep from uh, getting all turned around out there? Well, that's a very good question, Digger. And um, uh, the answer is, uh, we don't. Uh, the first time I was out there, I came down the payload bay and uh, I thought it was all lined up and everything was looking nice and rosy. And then when I looked down on the payload bay, I realized I had uh, lost uh, my frame of reference and didn't know what was up or down. And I literally had to take a couple seconds just to get my brain back uh, and figure out uh, points in space where I actually was before I could move. So uh, you have to be careful when you're moving around out there that you don't move too fast and that you're always watching where you're going because you can uh, spin your gyros real quick. Columbia Houston, we've just completed a handover in the control center, so this will be the Orbit One Team swan song for the flight. It's been said that one picture is worth a thousand words, and that couldn't be more true than in the case of the Hubble. But words are inadequate to describe what you have accomplished. Simply put, and if you'd allow me to turn a phrase, you have enabled mankind to look where no one has looked before. And I'm certain that in the ensuing weeks and years, the world will marvel at the inevitable discoveries to come so rather than a swan song, this is a new beginning in more ways than one. God bless you for your, for your efforts, and may he guide you to a safe landing. And on behalf of the stock at Goddard, the CSR here in Houston, and all the folks at MCC, we like to say thanks for the ride. We'll see you at Ellington. Thank you, Mario. Your message uh, very well received up here. Of course, we couldn't do it without all the help from the stock and the back rooms in the CSR, and of course, all of the support we've gotten from the Johnson Space Center, from the control room to the engineers, uh, to everybody who helped prepare all our equipment for the spacewalks. The uh, Hubble, it's been a real privilege to work on the Hubble. It's an experience, I think, that's changed all of our lives up here, and I know that in the coming months and years, the beautiful images and data that will come from the Hubble Space Telescope will change the lives of virtually everybody on planet Earth. Thanks for your message. 
as you're out there and you're walking in space, what are you looking at? What are you seeing? I mean, aside from your mission, which is working on the Hubble and, and, and getting that back into shape, what are you seeing around you? Uh, this is Mike Massimino. Uh, it, for me, um, at times, I was really concentrating on what I was doing, and you're, you're only looking straight ahead, say, into one of the, uh, one of the bays of the telescope and working on, a, on an instrument or removing a, uh, a, an instrument or putting it in, and you can almost forget where you are. You're, I felt just like I was in the pool where we trained because it was very similar to that experience. But then that time would pass, and it would be time to move to another location, and you might have a minute, sometimes I had a moment or two to look at where I was, and it was, it was just amazing. You'd, you'd look out over the shuttle, and at times during the daylight would see the Earth below you, and it was just spectacular. It, it was incredible. The, the view around you in the suit where you can look all around and see the Earth going by is just, it's just beautiful. It's, it's amazing. It's, 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 hard. it's really hard to imagine. I don't think any adjective that I could think of or any words I could use could ever describe it. It was just, just an awesome sight. And to, you know, to be out there and, and to look at your friends inside, I could see clearly into the shuttle when I was pointed in that direction, to see my, my friends inside working with us, Nancy flying us around on the arm and, and our, other, our other crewmates, and to also look at my buddy Jim Newman, who I was spacewalking with, and, and look into his eyes and see what he was seeing. It was it just those are the memories I think that'll stay with me forever. What, what will you think of when you look back on this, and, and how do you feel about being such an important part of history in the making? Well, this is exactly why I wanted to come to NASA. I wanted to be part of uh, what I feel is the, the greatest adventure that mankind has ever undertaken, uh, however small my part. Um, right now, I think when I look back on this mission, I'm going to have an immense sense of pride that, that we took a team of, of seven folks, including... Um, we took a team of seven folks and were trained by literally hundreds of, uh, of uh, people back at JSC and KSC and uh, Goddard Space Center and actually folks all over NASA. And we were able to, within about a year's period of time, get it all together and uh, pull this mission off and, and, and be able to come back and hold our heads high that we did everything we said we were going to do. Can you give us a little sense of what Hubble can do in its current state better than the ground can do and what the ground with adaptive optics and other technologies uh, does better than Hubble, kind of how they work together to do whatever it is that you guys are going to do? Well, there's a couple of things that Hubble does really well uh, that can't be done on the ground yet, and one of which is that Hubble, being in Earth orbit, can observe during the daytime. And so you're able to point at a single source in the sky, say some very, very distant galaxy, and look at it almost round the clock. Uh, and that's something that obviously the ground observatories can't do because as soon as the sun starts coming up or as soon as the galaxy sets in one horizon or the other, they have to stop observing. And so Hubble has that ability to look at a, an object for a long period of time. The pointing system on Hubble is also superb, and so it has, is unrivaled in its ability to be very steady when it looks at a source. And any time anybody's taking a photograph and the camera shakes a little bit and the, the image is blurred, uh, that's an inevitable consequence of being on planet Earth. Now, these very big telescopes like the Gemini uh, telescopes and the Keck telescopes and, and others that are coming online are rapidly uh, encroaching on Hubble's territory, but that's a good thing because the two types of technologies work very well together. You can do a, an initial discovery observation on the Hubble and then go follow up with one of the big light buckets. Uh, the limitations on the ground-based telescopes now are, are they really only work well in the infrared and red to make the kind of images that Hubble makes, whereas the Hubble works throughout the entire visible spectrum and also the infrared and ultraviolet. Uh, now that we've brought the NICMOS back to life, we can do the infrared again. Eventually, I think the technology will be there that the ground-based telescopes will be able to do most of what Hubble does, but it'll still have a very useful function, in fact, maybe still a leading function in uh, helping to expand the discovery space and so I really have to stress that the telescopes all work together, and that's really the, the wonderful part of all this astronomy. This is Mission Control Houston, about uh, 4,300 statute miles behind Columbia is the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope was uh, released from Columbia yesterday morning about uh, 4.04 a.m.
Columbia, no reply required. With three and a half minutes to the LOS, message 83, 84 are on board. With the calm situation that we have, we will bid you a good night now. We know you have a busy day tomorrow. We will be listening if you need anything. Have a great sleep. Hey, Houston, we'll go ahead and reply. Thanks uh, for everything. We'll take a look at the message and uh, talk to you later. This is Mission Control Houston. You're looking at a view of the Galapagos Islands from a camera in the payload bay of the Space Shuttle Columbia as Columbia orbits over the eastern Pacific Ocean at an altitude of 350 statute miles. Good morning, Columbia. That was from the flight control team for the entire crew, but especially for Digger and Mass. It was floating by the Moody Blues from 1970, and it struck us as very apropos. As much as we're all looking forward to seeing you when you return, we want you to make sure to savor this last full day in space, gliding around with your feet off the ground. Thanks, Dan. Uh, that was great. And from uh, Digger and me, we sure appreciate them thinking of us. It's been, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. And Maryland Science Center, Space Shuttle Columbia has you loud and clear. How are you today? We're just fine. Thanks for joining us tonight. We are at the, the Maryland Science Center at Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We actually are the home of the Hubble Space Telescope National Visitor Center, so it's very appropriate we're talking to you this week. And with us tonight, we have 24 students from the Baltimore SEMA program. And SEMA is the Science, Engineering, Mathematics, and Aerospace Academy based here at Baltimore's Morgan State University. We've been working with them for a couple of months. They have many questions for you, and we're going to start off with Monty. My name is Monty. To convince us that you are really in space, could you show us some fun things you can do when you are weightless in space that we'll not be able to do otherwise? Okay, well, uh, some of the things you can do, I guess, uh, are float things to each other. You can see a space shuttle uh, floating slowly across 
across the shot. You can also uh, change your position if uh, you want. If there's not enough room down here, like it's crowded, you can turn upside down. And it's hard to hold that position in gravity without hurting your head. My name is Mildred. Can you describe the steps you went through to catch the Hubble Space Telescope with Columbia's robot arm? Well, the first thing we had to do with the robot arm was to catch Hubble, and so uh, to my left here is Scott Altman, the commander of this mission, and he flew the shuttle basically in formation while we traveled at Mach 25, he flew within several feet of the telescope, and then I maneuvered the arm over, and on the end of the, uh, on the telescope end, we have a grapple fixture, and a grapple fixture is kind of like a big pin sticking out, about seven inches long. We just maneuver the end of the end effector down. The end of the end effector is like a canister, and inside it has snares. We close the snares, and then it rigidizes, and then we capture the satellite. My name is Verda. I know that astronauts train underwater to prepare for spacewalks. How close was this training to the real thing? I, I thought it was uh, very close to the real thing. This was my first flight and my first spacewalks, and I thought that our training really prepared us very well. Uh, the the uh, mock-ups we have, the model of the Hubble Space Telescope we have in the pool is very similar to what we have, uh, uh, that the way the, the real Hubble Space Telescope was. So when we opened up a, a door to get inside an equipment, equ equipment bay, I felt like I had seen it before, even though it was actually the first time I'd ever seen it. I really felt very comfortable with it and felt like I had seen it before. So the training we got in the pool was, was, was really great, very, represent, very representative of what we saw on orbit. My name is India. What kinds of tools did you use during this servicing mission? Hi, and uh, we had all kinds of special tools made for this mission, specifically to work on uh, the projects that uh, were the main parts of the EVA tasks that we all did. So, uh, for instance, when we changed out the power box to the PCU on Hubble, uh, John here had worked on uh, tools uh, from previous missions to uh, use on this one. We had a special kind of pair of pliers that we could go in and take off the connectors with and put them back on. Um, and we have different things that were made specifically for some of the boxes that we put in and out. And then, of course, we had general wrenches and tools that you might see, similar that your father might use in his garage. But uh, all high-tech stuff and uh, very expensive. Hello. My name is Ivan Ashford. During your EVAs, did you discover anything that might affect plans for the next Hubble servicing mission? While we were out uh, doing our spacewalks on the telescope, we saw lots of different things that uh, were very interesting on the telescope. The telescope's been up in space for about 12 years, and in general, the telescope is in really great shape, and I think future spacewalkers will have uh, the same kind of uh, spacewalks that we had in terms of being able to service the telescope. We didn't really see anything that surprised us and would make it more difficult, and some of the things that we did will make it a little bit easier. We put some... Uh, door stops on so that when we open the doors, uh, the next time that, that folks go up, they won't hit anything that we installed this time. Uh, I think Hubble's in great shape and ready for servicing again in a few years. Hello, my name is Joshua Walker. My question is, did you experience any unexpected problems during your EVAs? If so, how did you solve them? Hi, yes, we did have one unexpected problem. On the third spacewalk, one of the spacesuits had a valve fail open, which resulted in a lot of water in the spacesuit. And if we'd have gone outside with that spacesuit, with all the water in it, it would have frozen up and probably broken uh, the spacesuit. Fortunately, we detected it before we went outside, and so we were able to clean up the water and to change out the spacesuit with a backup spacesuit that we had. It uh, cost us about two hours of time that day, but we all worked hard to, uh, to turn around the, the new spacesuit, and uh, we still got the spacewalk done that day.
Good evening. My name is Jessica. Mission Specialist Glensville participated in Hubble Servicing Mission 3A. What are the advantages of having a returning Hubble Servicing Mission crew member? Well, I was uh, thrilled to be selected to go back to Hubble. Uh, the first trip I did in 1999 was uh, the most exciting thing I'd ever done in my life, and so when I got to be picked to come back again, I was really excited. But the advantages are that having been there once, I un had a good understanding of some of the problems that we encountered or could encounter on the telescope, and also a, a, a toolbox of skills that are specific to servicing the Hubble Space Telescope, tools and techniques, and a, and a big knowledge base of what things are sensitive on the telescope, what things we have to be careful of, and uh, what things we have to do to, to be able to service it correctly. And that knowledge transfer to the, the new guys on the team was very helpful. Hello, my name is Patar. Can you describe your feelings when you saw the Hubble Space Telescope up close for the first time? Well, I was uh, flying the space shuttle during the rendezvous and had a, a good look at it uh, as we closed up to it. And it's just amazing to see it out there shining so brightly. At first, it looks just like a star. And as you get closer, you can actually see that it's the telescope. It's just amazing to me to, that we can pick out an object uh, that's been flying around in space at orbital speeds and then rendezvous and come up and join up with it until it was floating just inches above our payload bay. And at that time, it looked huge to me uh, as we were getting close. But it was just amazing that we could come up and station keep with it and have it just float right there in our bay until Nancy could reach out and grab it with the arm. My name is Seth. What inspired you to become an astronaut, and how old were you when you made this decision? Hi, Seth. Uh, interesting question. Uh, what inspired me to be an astronaut was uh, there was a there was a time in my life when I wanted to uh, contribute to what I thought was the the, the greatest uh, uh, quest that mankind is undergoing right now, and that is the exploration of uh, places off of this world. And uh, I wanted to be a part of that. I thought that I thought that was the greatest thing going on in our lifetime, and and uh, I wanted to help out in some way. Hi, my name is Shante. What topics and skills that you learned in school and college help you the most as your job as an astronaut? Well, Shante, uh, probably the most important uh, things I learned came early in my education, and that would be uh, just the basic uh, science courses, uh, doing well in uh, mathematics, biology, chemistry, uh, and uh, if you get a really good uh, basic knowledge of those subjects and go on from there, do well in high school, uh, and then go on and get a really good college education uh, at, uh, at your school of your choice, uh, I think you'd be well prepared for any type of uh, job you might want in society, and uh, also to be prepared to be an astronaut. We have here with us students from the I Have a Dream Foundation at the Rocky Mountain Mutual Housing Association. And uh, without further ado, let's get to their question. My name is Nick. You installed a lot of new equipment in the telescope. What was the most important thing you added and why? Hi, Nick. That's a that's a good question. Now we installed uh, lots of uh, lots of important things. We put uh, new solar rays on. We put a new power control unit in. We put a new reaction wheel in. Um, we put a new cooling system in. The one instrument that uh, I was involved in one of the spacewalks, uh, the ACS, the Advanced Camera for Surveys, that was our major scientific objective, and that is going to increase the capability, the scientific capability of the Hubble Space Telescope by a factor of 10. So I think we're all excited about the possibility of, uh, of what that camera might, uh, might discover. So I would say that, that was probably the, uh, the most exciting scientific instrument that we put in during the mission. Hi, my name is Brianna. 
We did a photography program in our after school program. How is the ACS different from the cameras we use here on Earth? Well, that's a very good question. It, the Advanced Camera for Surveys actually has three cameras in it, and it was built just uh, north of you up in Boulder, Colorado. The three cameras are very similar to digital cameras that you might have uh, at home or you might use in school, except that the main camera, the wide field camera, has a really huge detector chip. That's kind of like the film. It's a 4,000 by 4,000 pixel chip, and so it takes really super sharp pictures. The other two cameras are a high resolution camera. That's good, like the zoom lens on the telescope. And the other one's called a solar blind camera, and that's so that you can look very, very close to stars and see if maybe there's planets around those stars. Hi, my name is Samira. Now that you have released the Hubble Space Telescope, how long will it take to get the first picture, and when will we see it? Since the, the camera is, is such a special camera, and we've released it from the Hubble, the, uh, the telescope team is going to wait a little while before they turn it on. And that's because even though we're, we're nearly in a vacuum, uh, just going in and servicing the telescope and having people in the space shuttle nearby causes a little bit of contamination to live around the telescope for a while. So they'll probably wait at least a couple of weeks before they take their first picture, and it'll probably be a month or so before we, uh, we see the results. Hi, my name is Shaquille. Were were you scared when you when you turned the the power off on the telescope? I guess we were a little bit uh, concerned or scared about turning the power off on the telescope because there's always a worry that when you go to turn it back on, that something might break. As you know. It's usually when you're turning on your TV or your light bulb that that's the most chance for something to, to break or pop. Inside the telescope are all these relays that have, some have been cycled and some haven't, little switches. And so we were all very concerned and very relieved when we heard that the power up was successful. This question is from Sharon. Can you describe how lift off feels? It's uh, almost indescribable. You're sitting there on the pad waiting for the engines to light off, and you feel like you're back in the simulator until all of a sudden uh, the engines light up, the whole vehicle starts shaking, and there's no doubt in your mind you're no longer in a simulator. This is the real thing. And then the solid rocket boosters light off, and you get a huge kick in the pants as uh, you roar off the pad. It's just an indescribable, incredible rush of exhilaration, feeling of raw power as you accelerate up. It was just, uh, just beautiful. You kind of tell I'm still excited about it. Well, thank you, STS-109. We're here. Our time's at an end. We have been watching your work for the last week. You've done great stuff, and we can't wait to see you come back and see those great new pictures from Hubble, which we'll be showing at our museum and the one in Denver. Good night. Thanks a lot. Well, good night. It's been great having you with us on this mission, and we've enjoyed talking tonight. Houston, Columbia, Franco. Columbia, Houston, go ahead. Yeah, Roland, we were wondering uh, at what time do you pick up the KU and uh, will we be on time for the next event? Columbia, Houston, uh, Nancy, we should have uh, KU at 1834 with the event starting at 1835. Copy, thanks. No problem, and we assume that uh, you'll be using the same location as uh, your previous one? Yes, we're on the mid-deck. If, if we're not on the flight deck, uh, chances are we're on the mid-deck, and that's where we'll be. We knew we'd be able to track you down somewhere. Thank you. Could you... Uh 
describe or characterize uh, the mission in terms of its success in your mind? And could you tell us whether you and your crew are exhausted, exhilarated, or some of both? Hey, Mark. Uh, it's great to talk to you again. Uh, you know, as I look back over this mission, uh, we had kind of a, a rough start. Everybody came together. The team really responded. And from that point on, from the time we had the Fran failure, it's been an uphill climb. We've worked incredibly hard, uh, been very busy, but also, I think, incredibly successful. And I just couldn't be prouder of the whole team, both all of us up here and the folks down there who worked so hard to make this a success. And yes, you're right, we are exhausted, but we are also exhilarated. Unbelievable that uh, we got everything we set out to do accomplished. We're really thrilled about that, and we're looking forward to coming home and sharing some more with everybody. When you were maneuvering the uh, arm around, you did some work with the telescope and some work with the spacewalkers. Um, did you feel more pressure to handle the telescope delicately or, or your spacewalkers? I'm getting a lot of grief for that question, but uh, actually, um, you know, there's a high level of stress for both. Um, obviously, if we didn't grapple the telescope, there wouldn't have been five EVAs, and so it started with that. And I just kind of looked at it as one step at a time. And uh, especially as a flight engineer also, I just took it one day at a time, one step at a time, and focused on the task for that day. But uh, yeah, I would be uh, absolutely uh, untruthful if I didn't say I wasn't nervous on grapple day, uh, because uh, grappling a free flyer, um, is probably one of the more difficult things we do with the arm, although it is uh, always on my mind that i got a human being on the end. Basically, at one point, Jim uh, called himself an end effector as we were putting in the uh, advanced camera for survey and uh, basically driving him in with the arm. For the commander, um, this was your first, uh, your first flight as commander. Did you feel any real pressure to to maybe uh, jump into a spacesuit yourself or take over the robot arm earlier than you were supposed to? Oh, uh, everybody just uh, did so well. They trained so hard and worked so hard up here. Uh, I probably had the easiest job of all. I just got to sit back and watch everybody do their jobs. And it's a great uh, team effort, both on the ground and up here. I just can't thank everybody enough, uh, from my crew to the, the whole support staff at Houston. In terms of the uh, Freon loop number one situation, I am wondering what your cockpit displays will show you, whether they would enable you to monitor flow rates within that particular loop, and if you have any lingering concerns about that situation. Well, we do have indications uh, here, you know, as well as all the data the ground has, but we see the aft uh, coal plate basically is a black box, and we get a flow rate indication through that. Uh, and we've monitored that and looked at it. It's remained basically stable through the flight. And I know uh, ECOM on the ground uh, has probably been staring at that number as well, alert to let us know if there was any degradation. But uh, we're really happy with the shape of Columbia. It's worked out fine from a few nervous moments uh, to a big success. I think uh, we're all just elated that we got to stay up here and complete the mission. And just a quick follow on that, what um, actions would be required on either the part of you and Digger or the ground if you for some reason had to switch over to uh, loop two and fly solely on that? And what would be the upshot if both loops for some reason went down after the deorbit burn? Well, uh, I guess the quick answer is we'd all get very warm. Uh, the shuttle actually works on both Freon loops all the time, so if you lose one, you have to sh start shutting equipment off. If you lose both, you've got to get on the ground as soon as possible. So if something like that had happened, that was the big concern. Would the one degraded cooling loop have enough capability to get us to the ground with all the equipment and redundancy that we needed? And the ground decided, looking at the rates, that it would we were uh, capable of a next worst case failure, and that's uh, what allowed us to stay up here the rest of the time. Since you've been spacewalking now on the station and the Hubble, um, which of your experiences stands out as the most uh, as your most memorable spacewalking uh, day? 
I think that each one is in its own uh, category of memory, its own uh, special place. The, uh, the When we put the International Space Station together and on its path there, uh, that was very, very special when Jerry and I went out. And as you know, Jerry's going out again next month on the station. Uh, doing Hubble, though, is a very special experience because it is such uh, an internationally known uh, piece of equipment. And it's so productive and it's so demanding. So each one is uh, very special in its own way, uh, but they're both very different types of spacewalks. I mean, was this mission everything that you really expected it to be? Yes, everything and more. Um, in my mind, before the mission, I, I think I was thinking I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't accomplish all the objectives, but uh, it's, uh, we went out there and then did it, and we did it together, and, and I think as far as any particular day, the day that uh, probably jazzed me the most so far would be Rendezvous Day. It was uh, just such a thrill after all the, the training we've had to see that, that happen for real, and to, uh, there was one point when, when Hubble was still quite a ways out, and, and uh, Scooter had me go back and look out the overhead window, and there's this beautiful golden star, and uh, I just couldn't believe it was happening. It seemed like like a dream. The uh, crew on board uh, Columbia will uh, shortly press into the activation of one of three hydraulic power units on the orbiter to begin the flight control system checkout that will uh, verify the operation and uh, the health of all of the aero surfaces on the orbiter, the typical day before landing checkouts of Columbia's systems. And a good view of the reaction control system jets uh, firing at the rear of Columbia. This view uh, looking aft uh, in the payload bay. The uh, shuttle's 50-foot long robot arm on the right side, uh, which was used to retrieve and deploy the Hubble Space Telescope and maneuver spacewalkers around during five days of servicing tasks. In the foreground is the rigid array carrier, the cargo carrier, in which the old solar arrays for the Hubble Space Telescope are housed and which will be returned to the European Space Agency. This is Mission Control Houston. Columbia currently moving off the northern coast of the continent of Australia, beginning a southwest to northeasterly swing across the Pacific Ocean, soon to cross the equator to begin the 151st orbit of this mission. All of Columbia's systems in good shape. Uh, one of uh, several dozen uh, reaction control system jets failed uh, during the reaction control system hot fire test a short time ago because of a low chamber pressure, but it is one of four such jets and a package of yaw firing jets at the rear of the orbiter, and so that has no impact to tomorrow morning's entry and landing. Columbia is uh, moving into an orbital sunset at the moment at an altitude of 338 statute miles. All of its other systems checked out perfectly. Uh, earlier this morning, uh, the flight control system checkout and the activation of one of three hydraulic power units uh, went off without a hitch. And so Columbia is in good shape, ready to support entry and landing tomorrow morning to the Kennedy Space Center. Columbia moving across the southern Indian Ocean, the island of Madagascar, here on your screen, the uh, southern tip on the right-hand side of your screen. The western coast of Mexico in view here. This is Mission Control Houston. In the center of your screen is the uh, Atlantic coast of Southern Africa. North is to the uh, bottom right of your screen and south is to the top left. Well, it's that time of night again, guys, and uh, this is Orbit 2's last shift, assuming that you land on time. I'd like to say I can't top Mario, but this has been a privilege for me and all of the Orbit 2 team and I'd like to leave you with this. We all know that the best stories are the ones that are still there when grandchildren are running around, and I expect that many stories from this adventure will still be vivid when, for us all when that time comes.
stories from the Freon Loop that almost did not let us begin to that wonderful feeling of success after the fifth EVA. I think that the number of times that all of us here on the ground recount with pride the fact that we were there and that we knew the guys who did this will echo the spirit that we all shared this week. Now, one of the guys on the ground who had his first flight as flight director is just sitting on my left here, is the Orbit 2 flight director, Tony Sakachi. And with the focus he showed you guys, he no doubt has a long, distinguished career in front of him. So off in the future, when he becomes a famous flight director, say, like on the first mission to Mars, one of the stories you can tell your ground grandchildren is that it was he who was the first-time flight, first flight director when they put that amazing advanced camera for survey on the Hubble. So I know that Tony thanks you for the good show you gave him on his first flight, and to the crew of STS-109, stay in the corridor at the entry interface, have a safe landing, see you at Ellington, and good night. And to Steve, uh, Tony, and the rest of the MCC team, uh, Steve, just uh, tremendously eloquent words. We really appreciate every one of your thoughts. It's been an honor to be uh, just uh, the tip of the spear here, part of the big uh, team. Tony, uh, it's been a joy to work with you. We appreciate the support you've given uh, throughout the entire mission preparation and execution. And uh, the words fail me, basically. It's been a, a tremendous privilege to be here, and just thank you very much.